Welcome to the J3 University Podcast. Each week, we bridge the gap between science and in-the-trench experience for physique enhancement. I'm your host, John Jewett. Let class begin. The questions you're not asking your females, and this is no matter where you're getting your female from pre-contest, off-season, their pre-prep phase, this is where you must begin the conversation for your female to really see out their fullest development. So Luke is with me. We are going to dive into some questions that you might not be thinking to ask your females and what really needs to be in there to assess your female thoroughly. Yeah, I think I think a large portion of this is having an understanding of how long has this athlete been competing, um, kind of as soon as they walk in, um, so that we can start to guide the question asking around menstrual cycle health and where they're at specific to the duration of competing. Because obviously, like a lot earlier on, we're not going to be seeing quite as much menstrual cycle dysfunction versus later on in, in most people as they've been competing for longer. And then <clears throat> that's kind of where we're going to start a lot of these questions, especially especially if you're catching someone, in my opinion, in the off season, like we know post-contest there's going to be something disarray. Like there's, there's that aspect of it as a part of the post-show phase. But in the off season, we should be getting this athlete – as close to menstrual cycle normality as possible with the pre-existing history of the client, whether that's competing and everything like that. And I think a lot of it's going to start there because I think one important aspect for us to cover, and we're going to have to cover BC at some point as well, is that baseline hormonal environment being the core place for a female to progress. Yeah, I know a lot of this can revolve around the the menstrual cycle and for you know people people listening why why does that even matter? <laughs> and it's needs to align with when you when you do have a female coming in when you're doing their needs assessment and you're seeing what division they're in, what their goal is within that division and if it if it meets within their also their risk profile which that risk profile being virilization uh, if you're an enhanced female and or if we want to say like a a loss of femininity, right? And those need to align. And a lot of times they're not aligning. And so we need to assess like for that female, you know, what does their femininity mean to them? What do they not want to compromise around it? And that's why like the menstrual cycle even comes up because having normal menstrual cycle function, which we're talking about a, a, an ovulatory menstrual cycle to where you have proper rises in estradiol and progesterone. And those are have much like a great protection around just having the feminine traits and also long-term health for, for bone, cardiovascular health, brain health, um, and, and just it's what makes you a female. So if we're trying to maintain female aspects around that athlete, getting back to that state of what we could say is a, a optimal health for a, a femininity would be what we want to be asking the questions around and why it would be important that that's always coming up in that because that is part of your risk management strategy. And for some, will be more risk adverse depending on their own personal beliefs, but also goals for the division. Yeah. And I think potentially even the fertility goals of the athlete falls within that, right? I think that's a question that has to be asked within this confines of the risk model, because we've spoken on before about the divergence of bodybuilding and fertility and the harder you pursue one, the more it's going to detriment from the other. So in this case, like, the further, <clears throat> the further and the harder that you pursue bodybuilding to an extreme high level within female physique sports, outside of the genetic elite who are extremely resilient, you're going to see more disarray to the fertility aspects of that. And so 
we need to understand where that athlete is at as well from a maturity standpoint and helping them make that decision. So having that conversation with them about, you know, are kids on the horizon? Is this something that you want out of post bodybuilding life or not? Or is bodybuilding and pursuing that you're all in on? And then are they even mature enough to make that decision? Because we've talked about this before where a lot of those younger athletes, 20, 21, 22, they're so gung ho on the bodybuilding and may not even be in a place where they can objectively make that decision in the first place. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's uh that's one, that's a tough one to balance. Cause you do have someone that's usually the younger you are more risk adverse. You are, you, you just have your eye on the prize and the blinders are kind of on and you could be very agreeable to pursuing the pro card or pro win or whatever, whatever it may be. And selling yourself that those things don't matter to you or they don't matter until they matter. Right. I've had lots of people that say I would never have kids. And then they, they're the ones that have like three kids now. (laughs) And so you, you you might not truly know. So uh, regardless, like with the younger athlete, it's still developing them in all the other areas with nutrition and training and, setting good groundwork so they can get the most out of those before you're dumping in a lot of androgens and just kind of masking poor training nutrition and just overall uh, routine management. And that way they have some time to develop those other aspects and see if even this is for them and also get a greater grasp on their like potential within this to see how hard it is worth pursuing it. Yeah. And I think if, if we're able to answer those questions upon intake, now the direction and path of moving forward is a little bit clearer. Now, don't know if this is where you would want to bring up birth control, but in my opinion, this is kind of where this fits in is like we're doing overall menstrual cycle health and we need to have an understanding of that relative to birth control use. What's in play? How does that affect the physique goals that this person has? How long has the birth control usage been there? And then also, in my opinion, and we can dive into this as deep as you want. I think one of the worst things that we can do as coaches is demonize birth control. Because at the end of the day, these are like outside life parameters that they need to be comfortable with managing in their own version of life that they see suits them, right? So our role within coaching is to provide information on how it affects the physique development process, potentially suggesting improvements in birth control choices and things along those lines relative to their outcomes on physique development, but not demonizing it because it is really easy and really clickbaity to say, I would never put my daughter on birth control or, you know, you should never be on birth control if you're competing and, it's a little bit short sighted in the information aspect of coaching where we need to be objective with what's going to create the best outcome, but also understand that some of these are kind of built around the life that this individual has built and then find the best happy medium between that. But I think this is kind of where that birth control conversation starts to come up on that initial assessment. Yeah. So with, yeah, with birth control, it's, it is a lifestyle drug um and i mean you're right it is has to be up to that personal choice and back to what we're saying like that female like not just females but just younger athletes are going to be very agreeable to you as a coach um because you are very in an influential state especially when you're coming to a coach as an expert and your goals are being everything to you and that could easily outweigh like if you want to discontinue this birth control or be Uh, persuaded into a direction that maybe it doesn't quite fit within what you want for your lifestyle. So just as as coaches, like you have to be able to present the the choices. And like you said, like don't demonize it and let them ultimately guide that choice. But it, uh, and and even within the birth control, like the literature, like when we're putting together the female module and the birth control lecture, it's, uh, it's not so clear cut as far as hormonal birth control goes, like the, the the generation of progestion that's used, the different delivery systems, 
um, it's it's there's a, a lot of different ones that are kind of available around this and they usually in research kind of lump them all together so they, they you can't really differentiate between this one is quote unquote good or bad for physique um, you might just kind of have a picture of how they kind of operate as a whole but then it's also very individual too you have females that um, I had one female that did great with birth control I got crazy lean and then she, you know, d- made the decision to remove it, and actually, it was had a a harder time getting lean. And that was us figuring out about um, that some HRT needed to be present, and just the time course, like you said, like how long have you been on birth control? Because you need to realize the time commitment after that it's going to take to potentially restore you back to what you were, or you might not restore back to what you were. And HRT might be on the table. So, like, those are reported questions to be asking before you're like, birth control is terrible because you might have an athlete that's going to have some downtime and not pursuing what you want physique-wise. And they really need to realize that that um, there is, there is like, challenges coming off birth control. Yeah, and I think, <clears throat> I think if we do that and we just inform the client, then we're in a place where we can move forward with pursuing physique development in a consistent state that we can now react to as a coach, right? If we find this place that we've agreed upon and fits both directions within that, um, because kind of like you said, like coming off of birth control, that period of time to find that baseline could be quite a time duration, especially like giving them enough time to potentially bounce back and finding out where that HRT needs to land. So I think that's, an important question around that menstrual cycle, like health thing, because then we're going to start getting into the nitty gritty of length and frequency. And what does your lab work look around? Like, are you actually ovulating and kind of what does that hormone profile look like as we move forward from there? Once we kind of gather some of that base information back on the fertility, like I know people listen to this and are probably thinking like, what, what are, the impacts around it uh, as far as just prep, but also androgen usage and, you know, <laughs> how much can you get away with basically, or maybe what, what has been seen around uh, f- fertility issues. Do you have any like client feedback or things that you have seen in, re- in that regard or um Man, it's, it's so differential. Like I had a client get pregnant on prep this year, like, and then you have people who, who like Emily prep honestly wants and has an effect on her fertility metrics, right? There's some pretty large differences between those two clients, especially within the birth control usage realm, which is why it's kind of hard to pin down specific androgen use, right? Because you have one client who's used androgens for a longer period of time than the other, but the other has had seven to eight years of birth control usage and has had a larger impact on the fertility metrics post, post try post competing. Right. So, um, for me, it's more so with my female clients, I'm actually moving now into if fertility is one of those goals, testing egg quality. So you can actually pull what's called a, I believe it's called an ANH. Um, and having those clients test egg quality during the off season, because the way it works is with the ANH is essentially a range of values relative to your age. So like at a certain age point, you should have an egg quality of this range. And it's kind of like, if you want to think about it in simple terms, like, uh, over is like a a red middle is like a green and then the bottom's like a yellow kind of like you're looking at lab work so you have like this range of egg quality um and the reason i do that is because for these females who want to get pregnant post competing if they are already behind on egg quality it's only going to be that much harder to eventually get pregnant now we have other variables right like can we consistently ovulate all of these other considerations, what does the male side of that equation look like for them and their partner situation? But this is actually something I'm, I'm starting newer ish is for those girls that do have that asking them to get some of that testing done in the off season so that we can have a little bit more of an objective 
okay, how much of an impact have we had on the fertility metrics for that client? Yeah, no, that's, that's a, that's a good task because you could have lab work that looks great and it still might not be translating to fertility quality, egg quality that you need. Um, I had a consult with someone came to me with a very low AMH and uh, in a highly muscular division and the goal was fertility. So, and that was more in the front front forefront than trying to continue to pursue like with like WPD or, you know, is it making the transition to like a lower muscularity class? So you could have less, less risk. And that aligns better with the fertility, fertility goals. And we just in doing so, I, I know like her AMH came up, by quite a bit. And this was someone that was relatively pretty young. So it's, it's basically the, I, I say that the, the more you do and the longer you do it, the, the more it's going to be a problem, but that's not for everyone. Like you'll have people that'll completely go just, um, without any issue and have, have fine fertility, but then you'll have someone that, you know, like you said, just a little bit and you're going to have problems. So just have to be realistic. Like this is a, a, a true risk. And we can't say what your response is going to be to it. And so you just have to be able to be okay with that. If you go in this and say like, Hey, you might not ever have children by doing this route, or you have to have like a, you know, some type of futuristic baby that we create in a, in a lab somehow. Um, that might, that might be the choice around it. Right. Yeah. Or go, go the route we did. Right. Yeah. No, no. That's like, that's, that is the cool thing about modern technology, right? Is that even if fertility is down, like, I mean, we have a in vitro, um, sperm extractions, like you can, if you want a baby, you can pretty much get one now. <laughs> uh, it's pretty cool. The technology around it. Yeah. So yeah, I think fertility should definitely be weighed into the conversation and and for a lot of females that come to me because we speak on these issues so usually we, we get them coming to us with these issues now so and it's usually from coaches that never ask these questions and they were just unaware you know um i i don't think it was that they some of them even put the blinders on it was just never thought to bring up in a like in their mind that that would even be a risk. Like a lot of females, they might not be familiar with like even how um, androgens work or how, you know, some people think like Anivar is like a fat loss drug and it's not even like in their mind that it's this um, androgen and, and virilizing drug. Uh, so as a coach, like you have to really inform these, these females and not make assumptions of what you think they know and the risks that they, they think they know about it. Cause a lot of them don't until it's just those, those effects are creeping up, creeping up and they're all and they're you know achieving goals. So I think that's when the blinders get on. Like you, you're starting to realize things are there, and and you just kind of ignore them until it's then a real problem. Then you come to someone like Luke and I. We're like, oh okay, now we're having to like kind of backtrack, and it stinks because you know they've had success you know with using a lot of entrance, but then you're like, well, hey, this might not look the same as far as the rate of progress goes. But usually the time I also see that coaches that aren't asking those questions are also the ones that are leaning too hard into androgens and also not enough into like training review and uh, nutrition and lifestyle management to where there's like more to pull out there and you could still then utilize less androgen uh, because of that. Right. Yeah, I think you open a can of worms with the expectation management conversation. Cause I think that's the following question from there is once you've kind of started doing an analysis of menstrual cycle is birth control in play. Where are we at relative to our menstrual cycle health? You're pulling lab work to see where they're at kind of getting an idea of what the direction forward looks like. It's like, man, what are your expectations with competing? And I say this from a multifaceted thought process because from the coach's perspective, like we need to be asking the question in regards to what's best for the client. So in the case of like low risk, high desire for fertility, like is letting an athlete compete consistent year after year, really that best decision for that athlete, even if androgen use is low. 
And it might look good for that coach to put an athlete on stage, but it's not the best decision for that athlete for the risk model and the fertility goals that they have relative to their competing. And then on the flip side of that too, is like for the client, the expectation management around progress is like, we do have these holes oftentimes when they're coming to us that training isn't getting reviewed, nutrition, all that, like you said, but we also need to understand that social media age is a comparison age. And so we need to have an understanding that, you know, when we lay out these timelines for, for female athletes, being realistic with the rate of tissue accumulation and what it's actually going to take to be competitive in their class. And this is where I find like comparing to the Olympia winner has value is because they can now create a little bit more of a tangible difference between where they're at and what's actually competitive in that class. Potentially even like depending on how far down the amateur ranks they are, just looking at the most recent national winner, right? Like the NBC nationals winner, and creating that difference so that there's a tangible evidence of I have this gap from me to there. That's clearly a lot of a gap. So that's going to take more time to close that gap. And then that can create the buy-in for keeping them off stage long enough to do the work. And so I think there's a, a dual role there in the question asking once we get to this point. It's like, is your goal as a coach just to shell athletes on stage? Like, obviously, we're here to win. So that is that is a, a large part of what we do but is the question that you're asking best for the athlete and what their actual goal set is. I just don't see that happening, especially in some of the lower muscular divisions like bikini. And I don't even know if I'd say wellness now with how big that class has gotten, but (laughs) more so bikini. So you see these bikini girls using non-androgenics, not really going into androgenics for their preps, but they're competing every year. It's like, if you do the math on that, it's like, okay, probably had a five month prep, potentially a six month prep. We'll say five months, 20 weeks. So you spent five months out of the year prepping. You spent potentially another three to four months recovering. So that's eight to nine months there. So you had a three month off season before you went and dove into a prep again. It's like, is that really what's best for maintaining an obligatory menstrual cycle for fertility post competing? man, that's a hard no. We know like the duration of time for follicular development is going to take at minimum 100 days. So when we see that and we we know where this athlete was from a contest prep, it's like, man, we need to get that athlete to ovulatory menstrual cycles and holding those ovulatory menstrual cycles if fertility is that higher higher value point for them over the competing. Yeah, that's, that's both like the long long-term planning for from a coaching side and from a competitor side because to to really get females at their best like they will have to do this for a chunk of time and by not having those off season periods even for those that are like you said they're not using antigens but they're constantly prepping in and of itself is also risk for fertility issues and and also just other health metrics too and just productive ability to keep continuing the prep process it's usually after you know a few few preps like that like one prep you could get away with just driving someone in the ground and and doing that again with a short off season but eventually they could just completely stall and the physique's only getting worse start running into gi issues on prep um like this weight loss resistance, like ton of cardio, things aren't working. You're like, man, what what's going on? Like what I was doing, is it working anymore? And that's when you're running into the roadblock of you, you didn't plan out what you need to with the female to put priority around menstrual cycle health, because that in itself is what you're going to be translating into an optimal physique. Yep. So I think if you if you actually take the time to do that, that's why it's like there's so many variables to this. It's like how can we as a coach best facilitate this question asking? A lot of it comes down to that initial assessment that we just walked through is like having an objective direction forward because then from there, my opinion, managing the process is fairly easy um, in regards to, it may just be for how long I've been doing it, but fairly easy in regards to making those decisions of keeping them on track for that end goal set. Because once you've set the expectations of the client, they're on board with the expectations that we have the timeline built. Now it's just pushing that client to where they need to be throughout each phase. Yeah. I think put that down on paper so they can, they can see it and always remember it. 
is is important to do. And, and the, I think some of those assessments that you initially had, the, those might change kind of that as you progress through or and maybe up or down, right? Depending on where, where they're seeing out their potential and in, in competing. Yeah. What do you, what do you think about the constructs around developing the athlete from a psychological side to help with this? Because we can understand stress's role from impact on menstrual cycle regularity and overall hormonal health, especially if we go into the confines of really long, hard preps. And I think this is a question that I've asked more frequently that has allowed me to kind of do better with my female athletes is how good are you at managing the day to day from a stress management standpoint and asking that question in regards to what we're doing? Because if we've got an athlete that's on fight or flight 24 seven, like just from a, a stress component, a lifestyle management standpoint, which we didn't really bring up in the initial assessment, which I think is part of that initial assessment. We really need to aim to implement strategies that are going to allow that athlete to manage stress because it is going to be very impactful across the board in regards to like everything that we need to know for that athlete for progress. And I do think that, this is where I'm really careful with my sheets because a lot of the females that I work with do get hyper focused on like progress within a scale or progress within a certain metric on the tracker. And it's actually driving more stress with tracking that metric extremely frequently than if they were to, to back off on the tracking of that and just periodically track it when that need arises and the body weight's the one that comes to mind is like obsessing over the rate of gain or the rate of loss and that driving so much constant stress that it's actually kind of putting them in a state of constant worry, especially when it comes to, to check-in day. Yeah. I think there's a, a few things within that, at least for like initial assessment with regard to get some idea what someone's stress is like, um, like questions that I have are on upon intake or, um, do you wake up feeling rested every morning uh, rather than just asking how many hours do you sleep a night? Because most people might remember, hell, do you even remember like last night? Like, yeah, uh, did you time it? Some people don't have that. So, but at least uh, something they might relate to is like, do you, are you, do you feel rested when you're waking up in the morning? That might give an idea of around sleep quality that they could um, try to give you some good data on. Then I also usually ask, like, what is their profession or career? Uh, just so you have an idea of, like, what that workload might be like. Then on average, how many hours do you do you work per week? <clears throat> uh, what's your commute times to gym, work, et cetera? And then that just through those, I can kind of get an idea of, like, what their life looks like a little bit and to see how loaded it is. I'm like, okay, let's fit in like three hours of cardio. <laughs> it's like, okay, that's not going to fit. Um, when they're like, oh yeah, I work 60 hours a week and, or they're like a shift worker and their schedule's flipping between day and night. Then they have like a 45 minute commute one way to work. And they're like, I don't wake up feeling rested very often. It's like, all right, well, this is a pretty highly stressful lifestyle. And there's areas that we're going to need to manage within that. And helping in those areas will definitely help with lowering that just the allosteric load to where you might you won't run into like menstrual cycle dysfunction as soon on a prep and restore it quicker into the off season period. And that is what I've seen with females that that I've been coaching through that process is that the the downtime in the post show phase is, is shorter and they get back to a productive off season faster. And they also um, won't run into like menstrual cycle loss on prep earlier. And uh, that's why it's important to have those addressed because it, it, it leads to just being more productive in your physique. So people are like, hey, this stuff doesn't matter. You know, it's, it's just all about health. We just want results. Like, like, no, the health part is about getting the results. Like, this is where you're going to be able to optimize your female to get even more out of them and in not the short term, but I mean, yes, the short term, but also long term, right? So it, it goes both ways. So I think those are some good assessment tools 
to have. Do you have any other like questions around stress or lifestyle that you had in, or is that kind of kind of cover those ones? Um, I have some more specific ones around sleep hygiene, more so because I find wake and sleep times are the crux of stress management, in my opinion, and how well they execute on that wake sleep cycle or sleep wake cycle and how well they execute on preparing themselves for that sleep wake cycle. Um, so like common ones would be like, are you, do you go to bed with your mind racing often before bed? What does the last hour and a half before bed look like when you wake up? Are you feeling refreshed, which you already mentioned, but, um, just some simple things around what does the first hour of your day look like more so from me trying to help them improve that hour and a half before bed time duration sleeping and hour upon wake because it really for me becomes like the central core of how the rest of the day is executed because typically if you sleep better you wake up feeling better you can manage stress better if you are actually sleeping eight hours a night recovery is going to be better you're going to be adding more tissue and it, it also gives me some contextual information about you know, if I'm about to pull lab work, am I seeing things that could potentially be associated with dysray and hormone profiles, right? But um, that's kind of where those questions tend to arise around that. And that's going to be my main ones. Do you have any on, and this, I don't, I don't have it, but it's came to mind now because it's like a kid can be a stress driver is like, what, like, what is your current relationship status? Oh man, that's a good one. Yeah, I don't know if you. I don't have it. I just now that I thought about, it, I was like, is that saying is that strange to ask or not? Like, oh my god, no, because I've got a client case that this just happened on. Um, so check this. So client presents with large weight loss resistance and address hormonal dysfunction. We're implementing some stress management strategies. The conversation of the relationship never came up. Right. She sends a check in one day. It's like, hey, this week was not so great. Uh, just got out of a toxic relationship. It's like, okay, let's get back to the drawing board. So like a week and a half goes by and she's in a deficit throughout all of this. And uh, she like takes off and she rips off like 16 pounds in like 14 weeks. And she had been completely stalled for like the last eight or nine, like, trying to change all these life variables. And it's funny because she sent a check in like at that 15, 16 week mark. And she's like, man, I didn't realize how much that relationship was affecting me from a progress standpoint. And she's like super happy now. She's like getting response for the work that she's putting in and all this other stuff. And it's like really wild how that one little aspect of her life could have driven so much of an issue that it was actually creating that much of a lack of a result. Yeah, I've seen it. And this goes males or females, like where that pulls them. Like, you know, if you get in an argument and it affects sleep, that affects the next day, your thoughts are racing, you're less focused on all, all the tasks that need to take place. Everything all of a sudden becomes harder. Little things become extra stressors and it just adds up. So it's, yeah, it's one area that might not come up or, you know, people. I think when you're earlier on coaching someone or you just have someone that's more of a private person, they don't want to share a lot of those details because they kind of could view it separately. Like I wouldn't normally be sharing that with my coach unless I had been with them for a while, but I have other people that are like, it's like uh, they're pouring onto their diary, like, you know, in their, their check-in. So, but it, it could be something to just keep in the back of your mind. I think, I think a better way to phrase the question now that I'm thinking about it would be, what does your support system look like? Yeah. And I think that would, that way you can, that would frame it to where you're not just talking about like your relationship status, but it'd be like, Oh yeah, I have my, my boyfriend, he bodybuilds super supportive of what I do or my mom and dad, they hate that I bodybuild and I don't talk to them anymore. I don't know. Something like that to where you're not just drawing on like a significant other, but also for, um, anyone else that might be around that's supportive, but I think that might pull out if if they have um, any adversity within those relationships too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I think it's a it's it's one that potentially could give you some insight into how you know their day to day looks like in regards to 
the people that they are surrounded by too. It's like the famous quote, the five people that you surround yourself the closest is the representation of that. Right. But, um, in helping them get to a place where they are successful. Yeah. I think so, like some of my hardest preps were when there's like, it, it's a, it's a, it's a balance one for me, I guess. Like I drive a lot of emotion into training so I can have like phenomenal, super driven, um, in, into that, but also it's kind of, kind of the detriment and you don't realize how, uh, how toxic that can be. So, uh, but for other people, it's like, it can, it can break their day, right? Like that doesn't swing them into diving deeper into the process and training. It, uh, makes them shift away from it and get into like other outlets. So some people like for myself, like my outlet is training. And yes. so I can go train, but the issue is that I train kind of emotional at that state not as harmful for physique as like going to binge eat. But for some people like that is, that's their outlet, right? It's not training. It go, it goes towards food and that e either one is not psychologically healthy. <laughs> you know, I'm th think, laughing at myself about it because uh, e even though it's like, Hey, I'm just training really hard, but it, it does seem a little less uh, physique detrimental and the repercussions of that, probably aren't as vast, but, um, e either way, I think it's just important to getting back to topic, you know, assessing and learning your client a little bit more. And I, I think you know, you're bringing up about, uh, tracking metrics and people getting overly focused. I think that is, is where you need a coaching approach that can be for the client and not just st extremely strict on your own system. Cause I've, I've had to, change the way that I coach for certain people and remove certain tracking metrics that take them to negative places. And if I was just stuck with one approach and inform my clients to that approach, always like it, it would uh, be detrimental to a few people that I coach. Like some people just wouldn't fit with me. There's a lot of people that, that don't fit me with me and that's, that's fine. But um, I think we still need a little bit of leeway to be able to fit within those type of clients. And also learn your clients of, of a little bit who they are as a person. Cause I think online coaching, it can easily be a disconnect. So now with any new clients, I try to always have like a, a, a short, like face to face call that way there is some level of connection present and you can draw out like a little bit of the type of person they are. And in, within those conversations you're having upon check-ins, you can learn a little bit about the person too. Uh, that way, you know, like how they respond um, emotionally and managing stress around. And with coaching females, a, a lot of females are more uh, emotional than males. So you have to be able to realize that and, and coach differently um, to, to a degree. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I think it's uh, to get back to the to the question asking. I think sometimes with the support system question, you'll see that openness to it the longer you work with them, where you can have a little bit more of a dynamic of a, not so much a conversation about it, but an understanding of how objectively that affects them as you get through the months. And so um, I think it's, it's actually something that could potentially be on that initial consult, but might be something that you have to kind of take in as you work with a client over time. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, either way, I think that's a good, a good takeaway for things. And I know this was like about women, but it's for that one can kind of go for females and males as well. I think uh, those are some of our at least the the main ones. I think upon intake to look at which would set you up um, to better assess what you need to even move forward first steps with a female, but also for the long term. And I think remembering with, with females, just with coaching anyone in general, like you have a, a large impact on their life and you really want this to be a, a positive thing for them and, and never look back and have regrets about what was done. And they would be very thankful to someone that had those conversations with them earlier on and not ever feel like they were, they were led astray and that trust was broken, which 
I get females to come to me that, that feel that way because they, they weren't informed, even though it was their choices. But you know, it's like, well, you should know about all this stuff. Like how should someone know about all this stuff, you know, and the, and the risk along with it, like that's your job as the coach to inform. So, you know, always, you, you never want someone to be later in life and taking something away from them that they should have had, or they wanted to have. And that was your responsibility. So there, there's a, a lot to it. Sounds super serious that way, but it is, it is serious. Like you're, you're messing with people's long-term long-term health or that their children. Right. So this is why Luke and I have come out with the female module because it's questions that we don't get, don't get answered or um, things that are, we're seeing in females that aren't getting addressed. And not only about the health aspects and the, and, and within it, but also just bringing great physiques to stage and progressing them up to a higher level. And the, the female module has been released. So it's uh, now available, which for Luke and I, it's been a long, long time coming, but just to take you through what you need to know exactly from this conversation, um, female endocrinology, understanding the labs around it, the fertility aspects around it, uh, understanding birth control, the hormone disarray that occurs in several different um, aspects around females, all about PDs and in natural enhancements, and then uh, constructing the off season prep in a peak week and pre post show for these these females as well. So it's uh, it's pretty comprehensive, and Luke and I are extremely proud of it. So if this is a conversation that resonates with you, I'd highly recommend checking out the female module. Yeah, there were there were tears shed and, and blood given in the making of this female module. But like three hundred, we triumphed and we're here. <laughs> yeah, so um yeah, join, if you join up the female module, like Luke and I are in there, we'll be uh answering forum questions and also sharing athlete case studies. So it should we really want to foster a community for females that want to learn and progress their physiques. So I recommend everyone checking out. But anyway, thanks for tuning in, everybody. And we'll talk to you next time.